Thank you everyone for joining us today. We're about to get started with today's webinar, Research Data Preservation in Canada. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. You'll have noticed that you may have been muted automatically when you entered the room. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are unable to attend. We encourage you to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all of the features, including security updates. We encourage you to use the chat feature if you are having technical difficulties or have additional resources to share with the group. We do ask that you use the Q&A option to ask questions of the presenters. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. You may also raise your hand if you wish to ask a question. Questions may be asked in English or French. I would like to let everyone know that this is the English version of this webinar. We will be hosting a French version of this webinar uh, shortly after it at 2.30 p.m. I just wanted to share the code of conduct. So you can find the complete code of conduct um, at the URL listed on the screen. We will share that um, in the chat. Carl is committed to providing a welcoming, safe, and harassment-free environment for its staff, membership, committees, and working groups, as well as for participants, speakers, and organizers of Carl meetings and events. We do not tolerate harassment of any kind. I'd like to introduce today's three presenters. Before I do so, just a little bit of an intro to today's webinar. In this webinar, members of the Portage Preservation Expert Group will provide an introduction to research data preservation, including an overview of current service options and emerging infrastructure developments in Canada. Attendees are also going to learn about the best practices for long-term data preservation and have opportunities to engage in a discussion about how we can more effectively work together to address today's pressing preservation challenges. So today's webinar is being presented by Beth Kazook from Portage, Corey Davis from the University of Victoria and Carl, and Jonathan Dory. Um, so a little bit about our presenters today. So Beth is the preservation coordinator at Portage. Uh, Beth trained as a photographic preservation spe specialist at Ryerson University George Eastman Museum and has worked as the curatorial specialist for Ryerson University archives and special collections photo archivist for the Stratford Festival, and more, most recently, digitization project manager for the Huron County Library. She has been involved in a number of digitization and cataloging projects over the years, and teaches courses on the care and management of digital image collections for Library Juice Academy. She is currently pursuing a PhD in art and visual culture at Western University. Corey Davis is Digital Preservation Librarian at the University of Victoria and Visiting Program Officer at Carl. He has been working in academic libraries for 15 years, most recently as the Digital Preservation Coordinator for the Council of Prairie and Pacific University Libraries. He is active in several national preservation efforts in Canada, including as a founding member of Carl's Digital Preservation Working Group and as a founder and chair of the Canadian Web Archiving Coalition. Most recently, he became chair of Carl's Portage Preservation Expert Group. Jonathan Dory is a research officer in research data management at Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique, École Nationale d'Administration Publique et Université Telouk. He holds a bachelor in translation and a master and PhD in information studies. He discovered his interest in information management and preservation while managing, a, managing bilingual terminological databases. He is a member of the Portage Preservation Expert Group of the Preservation Working Group of BCI's Library Subcommittee and outgoing treasurer of the Association. You might have lost your audio there for a moment, Melanie. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> ready to hand it over to the oh, Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> thanks. And thanks for that, Beth. Thanks for the introductions, Melanie. Uh, this is um, this is Corey starting things out. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. It might just take me a moment, so bear with me. 
Um, okay, there we go. Um, okay. So, just queuing the slides up here. Can everyone see those slides now? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Well, again, thank you, Melanie, and thanks for uh, the introductions and to all the folks at Carl and uh, Portage for uh, making these things happen. It's uh, no small feat to organize these types of events, so I really appreciate it. Also to Beth for being willing to, uh, to be a part of this and um, also to Jonathan who will be uh, providing a French version of this uh, webinar in about an hour and a half. And uh, and we'll also be providing support during this call if anyone would like to communicate in either of the two official languages. So thank you to everyone. And uh, I'd like to start with uh, our uh, territorial acknowledgement uh, that we do at University of Victoria and to acknowledge the Songhees and Esquimalt people on whose unceded territories I'm speaking with you today. And I think this, uh, this acknowledgement should really remind us and ser serve as a, as a launch point in many ways for um, thinking and framing a lot of the work that we have to do as, as professionals in the uh, research data management um, area. And I, I did a little bit of uh, background. I've been, I, I, probably like many of you, during this whole COVID thing, um, I've been sort of going to history to help me sort of frame and understand what's happening today based on past experiences. And one of the things that um, is really striking about the last pandemic, the Spanish influenza, is just how much of a forgotten uh, event it really was, especially in relation to uh, First Nations in BC that had um, up to nine times uh, uh, the mortality rate compared to um, the general population. And at least in part, um, according to some scholars, that, that absence or that amnesia in academia uh, can be attributed, again, at least in part, to an absence of, of data that was not collected back then. And so historians have had to piece together a lot of this stuff. And we see similar things happening today and those gaps still existing around the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on certain communities, on certain individuals, and the fact that, again, we're going to have these data gaps moving forward. And so I really want us to think as we, as we work towards the preservation of long-term research data in this country, if, if we might not consider a more active role or activist role in terms of creating that sort of just society moving forward and the, and the data that we need to to do some of that stuff. So I just wanted to mention that to start with. Now, before we get into the work of what's happening at Portage in relation to preservation, um, specifically of digital research data, I think it might be useful just to get a sense of what is this thing we call digital preservation. And I have a little note there, it says it's more than just backup and storage. And, and every time I do a presentation where I try to describe what digital preservation is, I kind of take a different tack, so bear with me. <laughs> Hopefully this will help sort of illuminate um, what we're talking about when we do talk about preservation, because the, 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 um, the concept can get a little bit fuzzy. Um, so again, I'd, I'd like to step back to the 1918-1919 um, when the world was in the grip of another pandemic, and uh, this one, Spanish influenza. And this is a screenshot from the University of Victoria Libraries where we worked with folks at the Internet Archive to digitize and provide access to the local uh, Daily Colonist, uh, quite, a, quite a name for a newspaper there. Um, and in many ways, it was, a, it was a very different time in some ways. The, the Great War, World War I, was, was still happening. And so there was a significant amount of censorship and suppression of that pandemic news by the authority. So here we see the front page of the Daily Colonist from um, October 8th, 1918. And you have to dig four pages back for this little column beside this giant shoe ad to basically get the news that Victoria has basically shut down <laughs> like theaters and movies and basically public meetings. And basically, you know, it, imagine 
the context today and uh, when you're when your home city or town or wherever you are when when things really started shutting down imagine seeing that news for you know four pages in kind of thing so the context here really matters in terms of helping us understand the the um the event itself and so Libraries and archives have played a really crucial role in ensuring that we have original sources like the one in the previous slide. We've collected these materials and provided physical facilities for storage and access. Uh, we migrated formats over time to ensure accessibility. We went from, you know, from paper to film to digital files accessed through, um, through the web. And these, these are the clusters of activities that really are at the core of, of preservation. So it's really about migrating collections through time to maintain meaningful access for our communities. It's not, um, preservation isn't something that you sort of check on a box or you sign up for a service and it's done. It's about active ongoing activities. And through the example of the historic newspaper, I think we can see that the work of preservation is much more than, than, than technical. So in order to store and describe and film and digitize and provide access online, uh, it means first and foremost that we have to allocate significant resources in terms of people, in terms of systems, and we have to cultivate expertise over time and fund all of this stuff over the long term, even as systems and expertise themselves evolve and change. And so preservation writ large really is a combination of, of the technology and the systems and the organizational context within which decisions about resource allocations are made. So in the print era, these systems were relatively stable over time. In the digital era, things have really changed. And the, and the big difference is in the nature of the materials, sort of analog versus print. So if we think about newspapers, again, from a technical perspective, the material now is much, is much more fragile, it's dynamic, it's ephemeral, it's, you know, if you go to the homepage of a newspaper, it's often personalized in the ads and all that context is very, very different. And even thinking beyond that, the channels that news is distributed now, so you might actually get your, you know, here's an example of the Times Colonist, which is the sort of the modern um, uh, equivalent of the, uh, of the British Colonist. Um, you know, it's, it, it's also on Twitter and Facebook. And so, it's a completely different thing and there's a lot of different challenges and as we tackle these challenges we're developing new expertise and new systems and we're going to be talking about some of those things today but we also need to focus on how we adapt as organizations and the capacity that we build as organizations and this is really uh, the big focus of portage generally through its networks of expertise providing that support infrastructure to help people navigate these challenges so just to sort of uh, to summarize uh, when it comes to digital preservation, the technical challenges are really kind of like the easy, <laughs> easy one. I won't say easy because they're still hard, um, but they're only one component. And really we need, we need expertise and we need communities to cultivate that expertise. And really that's what we're trying to do in Portage. Um, and through Portage, through Carl, we also need to advocate for the resources within our organizations and increase awareness of, of the issues across a broad stakeholder community. Um, and really engage with those stakeholders uh, is really critical. Now in, in Canada, um, aptly, we have, we, through Portage, we're envisioning sort of this, this federated architecture to support research data management and preservation. And really we have, um, we have Portage, we have CARL, we have CRK, we have a lot of these national organizations, but they're also um, very much interfacing with the regional Consortia, COPAL, OCOL, BCI, COL, uh, and the researchers themselves. And so it's, um, it's sort of stitching all of the various parts together into a cohesive whole that really is um, the goal of the preservation expert group. And perhaps more than anything, because the scale of the preservation challenge that we're facing, it's, it's big and we need to work together um, and that's really, in many ways, what we're about when it, when, um, when it comes to Portage. So to provide an overview of the Preservation Expert Group, and I'll try to, I'll try to get through this a little bit more quickly, but here are all the wonderful people that make my job as chair so easy and enjoyable. And many of you are on the call today, and thanks for dialing in. Um, 
And as everyone in this group will know, I'm still very much learning about this stuff and I'm really looking forward to discussion later on. Um, please feel free to, yeah, to challenge anything I'm saying or ask questions or, or correct me if you, if you hear something that's not quite right. But I'd just like to point out all the wonderful people here that are part of the group. Peg's mandate is really, it's to look at infrastructure for preservation in, in, in Canada, look for the gaps and try to hit those gaps with, with, um, with systems and infrastructure and identify partnerships to do that work. Um, it, that's really the, the goal of PEG. And to cultivate this community of practice, that's a really important thing too. Our guiding principles, really, really important for preservation. Our tools and processes need to be community-based. Well, they don't need to be, but ideally they will be community-based, transparent, and open. And these are really key to sustainability uh, of digital preservation uh, efforts over time. We also need to remind ourselves that digital preservation in and of itself is not the goal. I often forget this myself as I'm in the trenches doing the work. It's about access. It's about access over time. Really critical to remember. And that we ha not all data can or should be preserved. And also, as you know, mentioned in, in some of the introductory slides, not all data is being produced. You know? And so that's an issue as well. We need to move, I would say, upstream in terms of data creation as preservationists, as research data management uh, professionals. But we can't save it all. And so we have difficult decisions and we need to come together as a community to be as smart as we can about how we determine what, is, what it is we're gonna keep and what it is we don't need to. And that really it's an ongoing risk management exercise. Um, we, you can never say that something is preserved. It's only, you're only preserving something. And I'd, I'd just like to thank Steve Marks for framing a lot of my thinking in this area. Um, and um, it really is an active process that we, um, that we do over time. We uh, created a white paper uh, a couple of years ago now. Um, Umar Kassim led that effort. Umar is, uh, is not on the peg anymore. I miss that guy. Uh, he moved um, to back home to support his family and, and um, left a real, a real gap in the community in Canada. So I'd just like to, just like to uh, call out Umar and, and uh, thank him again for his contributions uh, on that paper. But really what we did in this paper, and, and I uh, encourage you to take a look if this is something that interests you more, is um, start to think about what kind of partnerships would be required to build a sustainable national distributed infrastructure in support of research data preservation in Canada. And now two years later, we're starting to see the first projects and the first infrastructure starting to happen in relation to these recommendations. And it's at this point that I'd like to turn it over to, um, turn it over to Beth, the uh, Portage Preservation Coordinator to talk about some of that stuff. And, and Beth, I'll be um, uh, advancing the slides for you. So just let me know when you'd like to, to uh, have things advanced. All right, thanks very much, Corey. This uh, definitely makes it a little bit more seamless rather than having to bounce back and forth between screens. <laughs> Um, all right, as Corey mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the preservation infrastructure that Portage and the PEG are helping to build into FERDER, which is the Federated Research Data Repository. For those of you who might not be familiar with this, I'm just going to pop a link into the chat so that you can check it out at some point in the future. Uh, but to give you a bit of a high level overview, FERDER was designed as a repository for large data sets created by Canadian academic researchers. It is also a discovery layer that pulls in information from many other Canadian research data repositories, uh, but I'm going to be talking primarily about the repository function and specifically the preservation of the repository data. So Corey, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, before I launch into how FERDER works, I thought it might be worth spending a moment or two talking about the different types of storage that research data will pass through from creation to preservation, uh, represented by this friendly graphic that we have here. So when we're looking on the far left at active storage, what we're really looking at is the researcher's local system. 
This is what's used while data is still being collected and processed. It can consist of all types of storage media, and I think it probably most commonly consists of things like external hard drives and cloud storage or local computers, kind of whatever technology is easiest to implement and, and the researcher may have on hand. Ideally, researchers are backing up their data at this stage, which may mean simply keeping more than one copy. Uh, but it's also data that they are interacting with regularly. Once the researcher is ready to publish or distribute their data, we're going to move on to repository storage. This is where curated data is deposited into a central system. The system is hosted by libraries, research consortia, national platforms like FERTER, uh, and even international platforms. The repository creates an access copy and ideally, but importantly, not always, a preservation copy. The access copy is usually presented on a web-based interface exactly as the researcher deposited it. The files are made accessible to other researchers, uh, you know, sometimes with some limitations, there may be embargoes set for a short period of time. Um, and then that data rests within that repository for a given period of time that is written into the deposit agreement with the repository. If the repository has a preservation function, then at the same time that the data set is being prepared for display in the repository, a copy of the researcher's original data files may be migrated or transformed into an open format more suitable for long-term preservation. A number of other preservation processes may run at the same time, including virus scans, fixity checks, file identification and verification processes, uh, that's all the preservation processing in that blue column you see there between repository and archival storage. The technology components that allow for preservation processing and storage are very well developed in the preservation community. As Corey mentioned, we have the technology to do this type of work pretty well. FERTER uses an open source tool called Archivematica to automate many of these processes and because we are going to be talking about Archivematica again a little bit later in this presentation. I'm just going to pop a link to Archivematica in the chat for your reference as well. So Corey, if you could move me to the next slide. Let's talk about the human component of preservation. Uh, as Corey has explained very well, preservation is an active process. And I guess I should also thank Steve for telling Corey that preservation is an active process. <laughs> uh, it requires people to manage the files to be successful. We often think of archival storage, the, the idea of archival storage and preservation as synonymous. But in fact, preservation encompasses activities that really are focused on access as well. Interoperability and usability are at the heart of all preservation work which means metadata or data about data is an important piece of the puzzle. We want to store the context for the data sets we receive that will make them understandable 50 or 100 years into the future. Uh, like we are able to analyze information about the Spanish flu that Corey was talking about uh, 100 years later to sort of get a sense of the impact back then, we want to be able to analyze information about the coronavirus in 2120, um, hopefully, though, not as the result of another 100-year pandemic taking place. Because preservation information is also access information, this means it can be integrated into the deposit workflow. Here, I'm showing a screenshot from a further deposit screen where the researcher is being asked to provide information about the data set that they are uploading. From a preservation perspective, the metadata we care most about would you know, probably be ownership and rights information, although a thorough description that goes into detail about how the data was gathered, like what software programs were used to produce the data sets, the data files, this is highly desirable information as well. We do try to encourage this level of detail by asking researchers to fill out a README file as well as these metadata fields. So it can sometimes feel when a researcher approaches further that they're being asked for a lot of information 
But this is all stuff that we feel is very important to contextualize a data set that might not make as much sense 100 years in the future without this information. A curator will review these files once the depositor has submitted uh, and approve the data set for further. When they do that, they trigger the preservation processes. All of the metadata captured in the interface is stored along with the original files in something called an archival information package, or an APE for short. These packages are periodically checked to ensure their ongoing integrity. Uh, can you advance to the next screen, Corey? Okay, this is just a quick sample of what metadata might look like in an ape. The fields in the user inter interface have been mapped to Dublin Core and data site schemas, and preservation actions have been recorded in a METS file uses the using the premise schema. So all of our data conforms to schemas that are interoperable, ideally, with other systems in the future. And you can go to the next slide. All right, let's talk uh, what, what that archival information package looks like. This is the overall structure of an APE. Data files are stored alongside relevant metadata, preservation information, checksums, sustainable archival copies created in open file formats in cases where migration was necessary. Now, sometimes we receive files from researchers that are already in open file formats, so that migration copy might not necessarily be necessary. But if we're receiving files that are from proprietary programs that we're concerned about the longevity of using those files within those proprietary programs, that's where we'll make a copy into something that's a little bit more open. It's not necessarily ideal. Sometimes a little bit of information is lost in the open copy. But that's why we always keep both. We kind of hold on to the original as long as we can, and we keep the open copy as the best case backup. And can I have the next slide, Corey? All right, let's talk about the pipeline project. So the preservation pipeline integrates the human and technology components of preservation with the combined effort of a number of partner organizations, including Portage, U of T, Cynet, and Scholars Portal to provide a geographically distributed and secure archival storage solution for research data deposited in FERTER. Uh, it is important to mention at this point in time, I think that FERTER's repository storage locations are also geographically distributed with two national hosting sites backing up the access copies. So when we're talking about the archival storage component, these apes that we've created, and how we're going to distribute them along a pipeline. This is already kind of like the backup of the backup of the backup. We're extra, extra secure. <laughs> um, I also have to put a caveat in here that this chart I'm showing you is probably not the final version of what the pipeline will look like, since this is still a pilot project for us. But it gives you an idea of the work involved in ensuring the long-term accessibility of research data deposited in FERTER. It also gives you an idea of how this could grow with other institutions helping to manage portions of the data in the future as more little gray boxes get tacked onto this chart. And finally, I think it, it demonstrates really well that researchers are part of the preservation equation and that there, oh, oh, sorry, that there are people involved in all stages. We have curators who are trying to obtain the best quality copy and the best information possible before storage, and then people involved in ensuring the integrity of that data in storage. The idea behind a multi-part system like this is to ensure that we can handle the growing volume of research that we are receiving. So I think that more or less sums up my, my comments on the further pipeline, although I'm sure there'll be questions later. But I need to turn this back over to Corey, because FERTER is not the only research data repository option in Canada with robust preservation support. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent segue. Okay, I, mean, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, something that we've been able to achieve um, at the University of Victoria 
around um, integrating um, Scholars Portal Dataverse and Copal's Archivematica as a service. And I think uh, my four-year-old might be joining us for part of this. Hi, Owen. Okay, he's, he's disappeared again. Um, and I'd just like to thank uh, the good folks at Oklahoma Scholars Portal for funding um, basically developments within the Archivematica code base uh, to enable this to happen. So as most folks will, will know, uh, Scholars Portal Dataverse provides a publicly accessible um, uh, research data repository. Um, and um, University of Victoria and uh, obviously uh, any research uh, uh, organization across the country can actually subscribe to this as a service. So you don't need to manage it. And um, it's sort of a, a Canadian based um, alternative to the um, to the the Harvard uh, product uh, Dataverse was developed out of uh, out of Harvard so we have this this really wonderful um, sustainable uh, Dataverse service out of um, scholars portal uh, and I know that some folks are on the call today and so um, you know I look forward to uh, having them uh, discuss this a little bit more during the discussion phase if that's uh, applicable and so, Uvic, uh, to, you know, we have um, we have um, uh, signed up for this, and at the same time, uh, Copal uh, partners with. Um, so that's the Council of Prairie and Pacific University Libraries partners with um, Artifactual, uh, EduCloud at the University of British Columbia to offer Archivematica as a service. And basically, Archivematica is that that piece that helps um, bridge the gap, sort of between repository infrastructure and uh, preservation storage by creating preservation friendly um, archival information packages. It does, does a bunch of other really important stuff as well. So what we're able to do now basically because of OCO and Scholars Portal's work to um, integrate Dataverse into the Archivematica code base now that they've upgraded Archivematica for the COPAL service is through just a little bit of pretty simple configuration, we can actually see our Dataverse collections as transfer source locations in Archivematica. So in other words, um, with Dataverse as a service and Copal as a service, we're able to, to bridge that gap between repositories, um, sort of active research data and the preservation storage piece really easily. And so I just wanted to, um, yeah, so bringing that all together to expand the capacity to, to preserve research data in Canada. And just to let folks know that this is going to be a focus of the work of PEG moving forward is to try to formalize this a little bit more and fill the gaps across the country, especially when it comes to people's ability to access Dataverse as a service. Um, because uh, the, sorry, not Dataverse as a service, but Archivematica as a service, not necessarily through Copal, but there's other, uh, there's other options as well. And so that's another piece of infrastructure that's being developed right now uh, that the PEG is working on. So at this point, I'd, you know, I think I'd like to um, turn it over to discussion and to questions. Um, and we don't need to necessarily focus on these two things here, but I think it would really help because PEG is actually in the process right now of developing its work plan for the next number of months. Um, and it would really help for us to understand the gaps that you might have at your institution when it comes to long-term preservation of research data. Gaps not only in terms of tools and infrastructure, but capacity generally. Um, and and maybe a discussion about what what you might see Portage doing to sort of help address these gaps. And uh, we have folks from you know from Jeff uh, Jeff and Lee from Portage are on the call as well. And so um, this should be a, a good discussion. So I, uh, Melanie, I'm not sure how you'd like to 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 run this part of it, but I'll turn it over to you um, at at this point. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I do seem to be having some internet connection issues. Um, so if I, I 
jump off at any point, um, please just use the chat to let me know. Um, we do have one, we have, a, we have a, more of a comment from uh, Eugene in our Q&A. If anybody else has um, additional questions, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to add any questions or comments. But I will open up uh, the ability of attendees to discuss. But Eugene wanted to um, make a case for central dataverse and archivematica preservation. So maybe what I'll do is I'll actually um, I'll open it up so that Eugene can share his thoughts on this to allow him to uh, go into that. Just one moment here. So you're now allowed to speak, Eugene, so you can use your mic. Oh, sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I didn't expect to speak. I was hoping I just can type it in. But uh, uh, I'm thinking about digital preservation of data for a while now, in fact, for years. And Corey knows it very well. And Steve, too, and all other uh, participants. And I find it quite challenging. Uh, I find that uh, the that, uh, digital preservation of research data is, a, uh, is actually a complicated challenge. And uh, it's a very manual or quasi-manual process that requires uh, um, uh, expert staffing. And many of our schools do not have a, a, a research, uh, um, oh, oh, sorry, digital preservation librarians. We, in fact, only have two or three in Canada. Um, and many research data librarians, if you're lucky to have one, are not equipped to work with digital preservation because they need to be uh, 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 you need to have some ar archival background, uh, uh, really, because you actually uh, uh, have to capture the data sets with all uh, their provenance and, the, and address them in appropriate preservation metadata. And, and what I'm trying to say, it's a complicated uh, mix. And I would like uh, to see, it took us years, but I would like to see a coordinated national approach for a data versus to archivatical preservation for the participating institutions instead of uh, each school, be it U of T or UVic right now, I don't think anybody else has done it, uh, inventing their own uh, wheel and using their own pipeline to their own institution, to their own instance of uh, hosted archivematica. It will be great to do it uh, um, centrally, get central training, pay into it, and they make it into a national service, similarly to what they, uh, uh, we have envisioned is uh, further and actually implement. Just a comment, thank you. Thank you. Thanks uh, so much, Eugene. Um, I couldn't actually agree with you more. I think it's really, uh, I think that's the direction that we need to be headed as well. Um, and I think the PEG will be working through those issues uh, in the coming months. There's, there's other folks on the PEG, um, but does anyone have any thoughts on, on, Eugene, on Eugene's comments there? Because I think they're really important. I'm not probably the best person to speak to this, and I'm hoping someone from Scholars Portal can pop up, but that's what I understood was happening there, that the Scholars Portal Dataverse instances are being preserved through a series of Archivematica instances that feed into their Preservica system. Oh, here, I think um, Grant has very bravely Oh, I'll put offer it to... Put it, yeah. You know what, if you throw out the wrong answer, that's how you get someone <laughs> to give you the right answer. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Yeah, yeah, thanks. yeah, perfect. Thanks for bringing me into the call. Um, so, I, yeah, my name is Grant Hurley. I'm the Digital Preservation Librarian at Scholars Portal. It's been really exciting to see lots of discussion around Dataverse and Archivematica. Uh, like, practically in the last, like, two weeks, suddenly interest has really jumped up. Because um, we, myself and Megan Goodchild, um, and the folks at Artifactual Systems, uh, had worked on this integration project about a year ago. Um, and, you know, we really want to see people starting to use it, including ourselves. So at Skulls Portal, of course, we, we support Dataverse as a service, um, but we do not currently provide any kind of centralized preservation service for the data sets in Dataverse. Um, the thinking at the time was that uh, as um, Eugene sort of laid out, and as, as Corey mentioned, that, you know, the, participating institutions in Dataverse would make use of the existing preservation services that they might have access to, such as uh, Copal's Archimatica as a service, as well as um, the permafrost uh, service that we offer as part of our uh, service offerings to members of OCL. Um, but Eugene has made an excellent point, a few different venues <laughs> lately, um, that there is a real need for um, a centralized preservation service. I think it'd be a wonderful thing to see. Uh, obviously, there are 
um, questions around th things like resourcing, staffing, uh, technical resources, cost of storage that need to be answered, um, as well as um, governance questions as well. So, you know, preservation requires a certain kind of oversight, um, ensuring that the, the preservation copies that are made available to users uh, potentially are satisfying the needs of that community. And so um, how that might look in a national uh, context is something I'm really interested in teasing apart. So it does seem to me, um, thanks to Corey's kind of work as well, bringing this into the peg, that seems like a good place to have those discussions. Um, I was about to compose an email to Eugene a day actually to <laughs> invite him <laughs> to some of those conversations as well. So the timing is very fortuitous. Um, Hopefully that kind of answers some some of the questions. I'm obviously happy to answer other ones. Uh, but as far as what we do at Scholars Portal right now, um, there's essentially a basic uh, backup for data sets and Dataverse. Um, in the coming months, we'll be switching, the plan is to switch um, some of our storage uh, infrastructure over to our cloud network called the OLRC, which will provide essentially really strong baseline preservation friendly storage for all the data sets in Dataverse. I mean, so then the question becomes um, for institutions that want a kind of extra level of preservation assurance by creating a separate archival package, um, which, you know, data sets that they have in Dataverse that they'd like to process. Um, and then, of course, all the other questions about sort of organizing this work in a centralized way. I told you the technical part was the easy part. <laughs> it is. Yeah, the technical part exists. <laughs> I mean, it works pretty well. Um, obviously, there's some improvements too, as far as that Archimatica integration go, um, that uh, I'd love to see brought, you know, to the table. Um, it's the sort of thing where uh, we need we needed use cases to come to the table to um, to figure out what else folks were looking for there. So, um, myself and Megan actually wrote a, a paper at, uh, for the iPres conference. Um, let's see if I can post that in the chat, which lays out some of those things. And describes also the integration in great detail if you really want to go down that technical uh, road. So I will, I'll get the link for that in a second. Any other questions about these kinds of issues though? Um, and of course, anything else to do with, with research data preservation. We do have an open question that I'd like to um, share with our presenters today. So how much automation is possible in Archivematica uh, regarding microservices given the wide range of research data formats? As Eugene just mentioned, preservation is a very manual process. That is a really good question. <laughs> and actually something that we are investigating in a kind of subgroup of the PEG right now um, we won, we've run through a number of file identification tools to see how well they perform on those sort of esoteric and not widely used file formats that we tend to encounter with research data that, you know, don't necessarily make it into archives. A lot of the file format identification tools do really well with things like TIFFs and PDFs and uh, Word documents, kind of the expected file formats, and then you get into some of the some of the more esoteric stuff, and it starts to fail. So, uh, how much automation? I mean, right now everything is totally automated, but whether or not it's doing us any favors when it comes to these certain file formats is a question we are attempting to answer. Uh, from a preservation perspective, if uh, a file, I'm trying to think of, like there's a variety of basically text files, but they're structured text files that are used for different um, scientific uh, data sets. The preservation action that would be carried out on something that is a text file is probably not going to alter said text file. But we really are looking into this because we've realized we've got a bit of a can of worms with the variety of data that we do receive. So I don't know that that was really an answer uh, because we are, we are in the middle of figuring out, yeah, how much can we really automate and what's the end result of some of the things that we have been automating? Are we doing our research data any favors?
Thanks, Beth. Um, so if anyone, again, if anyone has comments to add or questions to ask, you can use the Q&A button or you can raise your hand in the, um, as a participant and I'll be able to allow you to join the conversation by giving you permission to speak. We do have a couple of comments in the chat, so I'll just read those out and then if anybody would like to add to them or further address them. So the first is, I agree that digital preservation is complex. Administrative challenges in the background of specialized software skills, archival training, and technical knowledge about digital file formats, preservation metadata. I don't agree that the technical part is easy. And another comment, most tasks can be automated within Archivematica. The issue is outside of Archivematica, metadata creation, uh, bagging, etc. Other comments to add? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that uh, perhaps it's my dry sense of humor and I, I certainly don't mean to undervalue the, um, the amazing work that does go into the technical aspects of preservation um, and it is the base of what we do. I think the what I was sort of trying to get across is that it's often primarily perceived as a technical issue um, and so when I talk to groups of people, I like to sort of broaden that out to help people understand that it really is about um, organizational culture and allocation of resources and some of these, uh, you know, collaboration and memorandum, you know, that sort of, that, that sort of human infrastructure. Hello, Owen. How are you? Uh, yeah, you can be down. <laughs> and I'll, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Just to, to add on to that, because I was sort of also promoting the idea that the technical part is easy. Um, I, maybe not that it's easy, but that it's understood. We know what technical components we need. We know what we need to carry out. And there's lots of literature written about the sustainability of certain file formats and about how to run file uh, fixity checks and how to, how to maintain data integrity. And that, that makes that part easy in my mind in that, that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. However, there are parts of that process that really do require human intervention, somebody to be looking at the systems and going, oh, why did that one fail? Let me have a closer look at, at what happened here and being willing to make adjustments and deal with problems as they come along. Yeah, I think Jonathan might want to, yeah. yeah. I can add uh, Jonathan here. Um, another issue that I've ran into, and it's not so much an issue as a recognition that other people have limits in what they can offer, but the on, on our campuses, the archival community, the archivists, the records managers, um, have expertise in preservation. Um, we shouldn't assume that they are necessarily experts in digital preservation uh, because like everyone, uh, everything is new for, for archivists and for librarians, but they do have a lot of background, a lot of expertise. And I think we don't often tap enough into that. At the same time, when I've talked to archivists, uh, colleagues and such, uh, they have said that often they simply don't have the resources to help, or they also don't have the mandate to intervene in research data. Um, now, things may be different in, in each of our institutions, but typically in Quebec anyway, um, archivists are not involved in preserving research from faculty members. So they will preserve things that are related to the administrative functions of the universities, but they often have limitations into their own mandates. So that's, that's another hurdle that I think, Corey, you've mentioned change management and organizational um, policies. That's another thing that down the road we probably should need to address. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Thanks, Jonathan. I think we have another question from Jennifer. Yeah. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, thanks, Melanie. Um, my question is kind of designed to open a non-technical can of worms um, that may not be the right question to answer or to ask at this time, but something to think about in the future. Um, because we're talking about 
thinking about research that we might have, we might want to think about in, tw in 2120 and things like that. But researchers themselves aren't necessarily thinking about 2120. They're thinking about the next publication. Um, they're thinking about the million and one RAs that they have to keep busy with stuff. Um, how do we get them involved in thinking about these questions? Because the pipeline is great. I mean, I, I, I've done enough archival courses that I can look at it and go, wow, this is, this is great stuff. But how do we convince the researchers that this is important for them, for moving knowledge forward, for the people who are coming after them? What a great question, and really one that I've also been asking myself. Um, it can be really difficult to get uh, researcher traction on this as one of the major stakeholder groups. So I'm wondering if anyone out there has any thoughts on this, because I think it's a really critically important question. I do uh, think that the coming tri-agency policy that is going to mandate that they have to deposit the research somewhere is going to kind of force a lot of people into a, a preservation system whether they were really planning on it or not so we do have we do have that coming does anyone on the call today if you'd like to join in if you have a comment on this feel free to raise your hands or pop your your name into the chat and i can open it up so that you are able to speak i, I it's jeff here i've been bumped up to a panelist so i can unmute myself at will um so my thinking is, and, and again, I'm very grateful to, to Jonathan, um, Beth, and Corey for their, for their presentation. I think it's framed preservation as, as in, a, in as clear a way as I've seen um, in the course of the last number of years. So I really appreciate that. And I, and I appreciate Corey's invoking um, Steve Mark's name as well, because Steve is also another person who's been able to convey to me the the active and frankly detailed and hands-on uh, work that's involved with preservation. Um, if, if we, th I mean, this is, this is perhaps a little bit simplistic on my part, but to the question that you raised, Jennifer, I think in some ways preservation is sort of that, um, that golden chalice that, that is somewhere far in the future for a lot of, of research data. And it's the last thing on the, on the researchers' minds. And I think in part, if we can succeed to get um, publishing their data into a, an access repository uh, into the culture of research uh, along that spectrum of active repository and preservation storage, if we can get researchers thinking about actively depositing their data or publishing their data into a repository along a lot of disciplinary lines, so, uh, and the dis disciplinary lines are you know, every discipline under the sun, but if we can frame them in the context of the data versus the furters and the domain repositories, if we can get traction there, then at least the groundwork or the foundation is laid for possible preservation. But the thread through all of this is curation. And I'm just keen on, on flagging the importance of curation in all of this. And so the curation support that we're developing on our campuses and the curation support that we've been investing in on a national scale with um, Aaron Clary, our curation coordinator, and um, positions that we po will be posted shortly for um, three curation officers at the national level, all speak to the importance of curation to move it, move data from active through repository and into uh, preservation storage as appropriate. So I just thought it'd just my thoughts on that in answer to Jennifer's question. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we do have another comment that I wanted to share with the group. Um, it was a message saying that one of the gaps at our institution is the personnel who can understand the technology and the troubleshooting. We have a hard time recruiting and retaining systems people because our collective agreements do not allow for competitive enough salaries. So if you have, if you have additional um, things to add or if you are maybe having a similar experience or how you've met those challenges, feel free to add that to the chat or raise your hand. And I do wanna pass things over to Stephen Klein. He's raised his hand and he'd like to add something to the conversation.
You should be able to unmute now, Stephen. Um, hi, I'm Stephen Klein, and I work at the CUNY Graduate Center in, in New York. And I am very glad that uh, the previous speaker, Jeff, stole my thunder. But uh, I just need, and I will reiterate much of what he said, but I don't think it's that important for the researcher to know. I think it's more important for the administration to understand that they need to support these endeavors. Uh, uh, just getting it, ju just uh, getting staffing and and uh, and possible hardware and software available to support these en endeavors and make allowing administration to understand the import the importance of uh, of ensuring that the scholarly uh, conversation remains intact. Uh, um, I, I don't think a researcher really needs to understand once they've deposited something in, in an institutional repository that backstage all these other processes are occurring. Uh, all our job it, it should be about is to guarantee continued access. Thank you. Hello? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I sometimes feel like you're alone. Thank you very much for, for that comment. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions? Again, you can feel free to uh, raise your hand or post them in the chat. Aaron, I've given you permission to speak if you'd like to share that more broadly or if you have additional comments to add. Sorry, I don't have my headphones plugged in. I, I actually posted the comment for all panelists. It was just a, um, agreeing with Jeff that curators can really be an advocate for, um, you know, and, and can work directly with researchers to get data that are structured in a way that allows for preservation and you know you might it might take time but that's sort of a relationship where things can start to slowly shift and once researchers have been exposed to the um, idea of preservation friendly formats and you know then the next research project they work on that's something that they're taking with them so just agreeing with jeff Aaron. We don't have any additional um, questions in the Q&A at this point. Um, is there anything else that the presenters today would like to add? I'd just like to, you know, thank everyone for their, their thoughts and their consideration. Um, if, you, uh, if you have any other questions, uh, do feel free to follow up with me individually. Um, and I can, you know, if I can't answer your question, I can certainly get you to the right person through the PEG or through other people. Um, and yeah, I just, just you know, thank you, uh, Melanie, for, for organizing this and, and, and Jonathan for doing this again in half an hour. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Beth, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to, to echo Corey's sentiment. So yes, you can get in touch with us if you want to learn more about what we're working on. And I think we had another slide that had our contact information. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah um, we, I think we put that in there. <laughs> There we go, uh, making yeah. it easier for you to reach us. <laughs> Perfect. So Beth, Jonathan, and Corey have their emails there and definitely welcome you getting in touch with them. So please take those emails down if, they, if you're interested in following up with them specifically. Um, we, will, we did record today's webinar, um, so you will receive a link to access the recording from today if you'd like to go back and take a look at it. You'll also receive a copy of the slides. Usually we, have, we aim to have that out with, back to you in about within a week, usually a little bit less. Uh, but we would like to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, again, if you have questions, please get in touch with our presenters and thank you so much for attending. Have a wonderful afternoon.